Then he showed me another vision. I saw the Lord standing beside a wall that had been built using a plumb line. He was using a plumb line to see if it was still straight. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I answered, a plumb line. And the Lord replied, I will test my people with this plumb line. I will no longer ignore all their sins. The pagan shrines of your ancestors will be ruined and the temples of Israel will be destroyed. I will bring the dynasty of King Jeroboam to a sudden end. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is hatching a plot against you right here on your very doorstep. What he's saying is intolerable. He's saying... Jeroboam will soon be killed and the people of Israel will be sent into exile. Then Amaziah sent orders to Amos. Get out of here, you prophet. Go on back to the land of Judah and earn your living by prophesying there. Don't bother us with your prophecies here in Bethel. This is the king's sanctuary and the national place of worship. But Amos replied, I'm not a professional prophet and I was never trained to be one. I'm just a shepherd and I take care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord called me away from my flock and told me, go and prophesy to my people in Israel. Now then, listen to this message from the Lord. You say, don't prophesy against Israel. Stop preaching against my people. But this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in this city and your sons and daughters will be killed. Your land will be divided up and you yourself will die in a foreign land. And the people of Israel will certainly become captives in exile far from their homeland. The passage Rachel has just read contains the only segment of the book of Amos, which is a narrative, a story that actually happens. The rest of the book is what we call today spoken word. It's poetry and prophecy in a variety of literary styles. But in verse 10, we have this short, this short story. Amaziah was the priest of Bethel, the religious sanctuary that, as we've already heard, merged the worship of Yahweh, the one and only God of Israel, with the worship of at least three other gods, as well as two golden calves that a previous king had brought into the temple. Amaziah was the stooge of the current king, King Jeroboam II. He had the king's ear. Amaziah sends a message to the king that Amos is hatching a plot by saying that the king will soon be killed. Now, that's wrong. Amos didn't say that. And the king actually wasn't killed and died much later after a long life. And Amaziah, Amaziah tells the king that Amos had said that the people of Israel will be sent away into exile. Actually, Amos hadn't yet prophesied that, although, as we heard, he was shortly to do so. It sounds to me that it was actually Amaziah who was hatching a plot to get rid of the Lord's prophet with half truths and downright lies. So predictably, the king sends word back to Amaziah that Amos should be got rid of, sent back to Judah and to stop prophesying. He should stop prophesying. Listen to this in what Amaziah, uh, what the king says is the king's sanctuary and the national place of worship. Now note that it's not the sanctuary of the king with a capital K, Yahweh, but Jeroboam's sanctuary. You see, when secular government and religion merge, it's always a recipe for disaster. Why? Because there's always a clash of kingdoms. Amos confronts Amaziah, it's a rather brave thing to do, which possibly, well, according to legend, cost him his life. We don't know that, but we can only imagine. 
I'm just a poor shepherd and a fig farmer, he says. I'm not rich and important like you. But the Lord called me to come to you and prophesy and warn you that the Lord is right on the point of having enough of your wicked ways. And actually, in chapter eight, he recounts again what those wicked ways are. You remember them robbing the poor, trampling down the needy, cheating the helpless, using dishonest measures, trading the poor as slaves and so on. And then Amos prophesies that actually, yes, the judgment is coming. And Amaziah, well, your wife will become a prostitute in this very city whilst you will be carried off into exile. Well, well, where where you will die. And by the way, your children will all be killed as well. Just to explain that when a country fell to a foreign power, all the men who survived the war would be carted off into exile. And often the women and children, those who were not required for the king's harem, would remain in poverty. And the only way many could survive would be to live in prostitution. Now, this is actually the first time the exile has been mentioned by Amos in the whole book, and it will be mentioned again. So what do we learn from this brief story? I want to ask you whether you're an Amaziah or an Amos. At first, first glance, that seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Of course I'm an, aim, uh, an Amos. He's the goody. Amaziah is the baddie. Amos does what God asks. Amaziah doesn't. It's a simple answer to an easy question. But let's think for a moment about these two protagonists, because actually they could easily be 21st century characters. Amaziah, the man who is called by God as a priest to serve him, but is seduced by the ways of the world, sides with the rich rather than the poor, sucks up to authority in the shape of the king, rejects the word of the Lord through the prophet, and tells white lies or not so white lies in order to retain his position. He benefits from the injustice of the society he's meant to be overseeing as the chief priest. And he allows the worship of God to be compromised by idols of fertility, but for fertility reads sex, and an idol of war, for war read trust in human resources rather than God's provision. And the God of weather, for weather, read of trust in false spirituality, like the prophets of Baal, who was the God of the weather, who we see contest Elijah on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18. You see, Amaziah was a man who compromised his faith and integrated his religion into his worldly lifestyle. He was the priest. He should have been leading the people to abandon their idols and worship the true living God wholeheartedly. But rather, he turned against his God and ended up a broken man in exile with a family lost to him. How about Amos? Of course we say we're more like Amos. But here was a man who sold out completely, wholeheartedly to God. He walked by faith, gave up his job, and with no training and no apparent support, headed to a foreign nation, a nation which really hates his own country, walks straight into the center of idolatry and confronts the chief priest. He did not fear Amaziah or Jeroboam. He only did what God told him to do. So who am I like? Who are you like? Amaziah, compromising my faith, indifferent about injustice and the wrongs of the nation, seduced by the world, accepting idols in my life which prevent me from living for my Lord 100%, or Amos, prepared to do God's work even though it costs everything, willing to speak God's truth even though it's hard, not willing to compromise my faith for an easy life. There's a challenge. But there's more to these chapters than this brief encounter between these two men. The chapter starts with three vis visions that Amos had, and they tell us something about God's relentless love. It may surprise you to know, but the title of my talk this morning is The God Who Relents. This book and these vision visions may not sound like there's anything more than judgment and future catastrophe here. 
Where is there any love, Phil? I ask you here. I, I hear you ask. Well, please bear with me. Chapter seven starts off like this. The sovereign Lord showed me a vision. I saw him preparing to send a vast swarm of locusts over the land. In my vision, the locusts ate every green plant in sight. Then I said, O oh, sovereign Lord, please forgive us or we will not survive. For Israel is so small. So, verse, verse three, so the Lord relented from this plan. I will not do it, he said. And then the second vision came. It was a vision of fire destroying the whole region of the Middle East, including the Great Sea, it says, was probably the Mediterranean Sea. Well, that's some fire. Total devastation. Firstly, a plague which destroys all the crops and produces famine and destitution for the whole nation. And Amos pleads with God not to send it, and the Lord relents. Then a fire destroying everything. And again, Amos pleads with God, and the Lord relents. I will not do that either, God says in verse 7. The Lord relents. You see, his love is relentless. His mercy triumphs over judgment. He pursues Israel and gives the people opportunity of after opportunity to turn around, to repent, to change direction. He sent patriarchs, as we heard in our story this morning, uh, in the beginning of our meeting, he sent patriarchs like, like Abraham to guide them, but the people rejected the patriarchs. Then he sent judges, but they rejected them. And then kings who they reject or who reject him. And finally prophets. The prophets get laughed at, rejected, and even killed. And then, of course, he sent his own son, Jesus. They rejected and killed him too. But the point is that the Lord isn't always patient with his people. Sorry, the point is that the Lord is always patient with his people. And he's patient with you and me too. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He's not a God who delights in punishing and sending hellfire and plagues and coronaviruses. He loves with a relentless love. His love holds judgment back. The constant refrain of the Old Testament is that God is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love. His anger lasts just for a moment, but his favour favor lasts a lifetime. God wants to lead his people in the ways of truth and justice and love and mission. He has called his people, and that's you and me, for purpose. He needs us to be in the right place, no compromise, no half-heartedness. And in order to get us to that point, he will allow us to enter the dark night of the soul, that hard time in our lives where we have no option but to turn to him. That doesn't mean he loves us any less. In fact, you could argue that it's because of his relentless love for us that he allows us to go our own way, to find the bottom of that dark hole so that we turn to him to draw us out with his love. Remember the story of the prodigal son. The third vision is perhaps the most powerful. It's the vision Rachel read to us earlier, a plumb line. The plumb line showed that the wall that was Israel was crooked. We had a retaining wall rebuilt recently in our garden by the wonderful Dave Smith. The wall had collapsed. It wasn't upright and the rain came and the wind blew and eventually it started to fail. And that's like your life and my life. If our lives are not built on a firm foundation and our walls are not built straight, we will eventually collapse. And now God says that because of the crookedness of Israel, he can no longer ignore their sin. It's a sudden and abrupt change in verse 8. He will allow the pagan shrines to be destroyed and the dynasty of King Jeroboam to end. And then we have this brief interlude, the story of Amaziah coming head to head with Amos, before we, we return to the fourth vision at the beginning of chapter 8. Amos sees a basket of ripe fruit. The Hebrew word here conveys the idea that the, ripe, the fruit was so ripe that it was just turning. 
like the last strawberry in the bottom of my punnet this week. It was going all mushy. It would probably have been okay for a strawberry smoothie, but actually it went straight into the compost. I didn't fancy it with my cereal or yogurt. The Hebrew word for ripe fruit is very similar to the Hebrew word for the end has come. There's a play on words here, which isn't apparent in English. The picture here is that Israel is on the turn. The end is coming. And then the prophetic word comes that the land will be overrun and Israel will be taken into exile. That happened around 20 years later when the Assyrians came, ransacked Israel, took the people off into exile. And later still, the Babylonians came and ransacked Judah, the southern kingdom, and took Judah off into exile. But God's relentless love was still there, despite their rejection of him. He protected them through the exile, and eventually, 70 long years after the Babylonian exile, the people returned to rebuild. 70 in the Bible was the number of spiritual completeness. And what God was doing was giving Israel and Judah time to reflect, to humble themselves, to listen again to the voice of God and to change. He didn't destroy them, even though he could have. He protected them, even in foreign lands. He had continued to love them, but he wanted them to change. And when they had, then Nehemiah and Ezra led the revival that was to come. Sometimes God's relentless love has to break us to get our attention. Exile is better than destruction. Being broken is better than being destroyed. God could have destroyed Israel, but he chose to relent. And instead, he allowed them to be broken through the pain of exile in order that a remnant would be purified to return to fulfill his purposes. Was God in the exile? Was God in the breaking, you bet he was. Just like God was in the breaking of his own son at the cross. It's at Calvary that we see the relentless love of God in his fullness. Jesus broken, pouring out his love and mercy and grace so that our brokenness can be repaired and made whole and restored. You see, restoration follows exile. Maybe a bit more about that next week. God is in the business of restoring broken vessel, vessels. That's the message of Amos. Come to me and live, we heard last, last time. Come to me, God says. Come to the cross of Jesus and be restored. Are you in the middle of, a, of the disaster? If you are, just like Israel was about to be, then remember the words of David in Psalm 57. Some of you may have received a card from Care for the Family this week with these words on it. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wing until the disaster has passed. Let's take refuge at the cross where we, broken vessels that we are, attach ourselves to Jesus who is the ultimate broken vessel whose relentless love and grace and mercy draws us to him, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, as we turn our half-heartedness and our compromise to wholehearted commitment to the one who mends us and makes us whole. Amaziah or Amos, half-heartedness and compromise or wholeheartedness and commitment. The pride of comfort and success that was Israel or the brokenness and restoration of a life experiencing the relentless love of God in all circumstances. The choice is yours. The choice is mine.